Hi, I'm Nina Mehta. And on behalf of Parseo, NICOR, Rethinking Schools, and of course, Haymarket Books, I'm so pleased to welcome everyone this evening. I am a co-director of Parseo together with Donna Neville, who has been a longtime educator and organizer, among many other issues for educational justice. And as part of our work, Parseo has developed a range of participatory social justice curricula, most recently the Palestinian Nakba curriculum with Project 48, which, as we know, has become more relevant than ever at this moment. And as part of our commitment to co-creating curricula with our partners that address issues of injustice and that challenge dominant exclusionary narratives, we've also developed our curriculum on anti-Semitism from a framework of collective liberation. And the curriculum is rooted in a deep commitment to mutuality, solidarities, and joint struggle in our work to challenge anti-Semitism and all forms of injustice. Our hope is that it contributes to the work that so many are doing, including the amazing educators and organizers, organizers we are so fortunate to have with us this evening to create just learning spaces and opportunities to engage in critical inquiry about urgent social justice issues in our schools and in our communities, especially at this moment when so many are facing repression for doing just that. To open up the program with our fantastic educa educator panelists, we wanna share just a few slides from our curriculum, which is connected to our work for justice in our different educational spaces. And, um, can you please put slide one up? Okay, the curriculum, which includes articles, poetry, visuals, videos, music, and other resources is geared towards many different communities. And we offer several modes of engagement for workshops and classes. Um, can you please put up slide two? Um, and here are just some of the topics in the curriculum. And next slide, please. Um, in the first part of the curriculum, we discuss and make visible different Jewish histories based on class, race, geographies, and other experiences. Um, slide four, please. Jewish ethnic groups include Ashkenazi Jews who are from Eastern and Western Europe and Russia, Mizrahi Jews and Jaiswana who originate from Middle Eastern, North African and Central Asian countries, Sephardi Jews from Spanish and Portuguese backgrounds and from Balkan countries, Jews from Ethiopia, Uganda, India and China. And we share how Jews from these different localities have had different histories and experiences with anti-Semitism. Uh, next slide, please. We reflect further on what anti-Semitism is and how it has shown up. Here are just a few images and quotes reflecting how anti-Semitism has manifested at different historical moments, from the Spanish Inquisition created to eliminate non-Catholics, including uh, Muslims and Jews, to the Holocaust, the most extreme, brutal anti-Semitic period in Jewish history, with over six million Jewish victims of the genocide. The Nazis also brutalized and persecuted millions of other people on a racial and political basis. So we see and show throughout the curriculum how anti-Semitism intersects with different targets and histories of systemic violence and injustice. And next slide, please. We engage in conversation and share a number of excerpts from educators and scholars reflecting on anti-Semitism as well as its relationship to other forms of racism. And next slide, please. Through conversation, exploration, and participation, including roundtable conversations like this one and others that we've created, we ground the curriculum in a framework of and a commitment to collective liberation. And next slide, please. There are two clearly distinct views of the history of anti-Semitism. One views anti-Semitism as eternal and in isolation from other forms of oppression. It is never ending, it can't be understood, and it can't be stopped. The other perspective, which we adhere to in this curriculum, understands anti-Semitism as historically contextual, situated amidst interconnected conditions and struggles. It emerges in different historical periods for different reasons and in relation to other forms of oppression. 
these different understandings not only impact how we see anti-Semitism, but also how we think about responding to it that is distinct from or as part of and connected to other struggles against oppression. And next slide, please. We look at anti-Semitism in the U.S. historically in relation to immigration and social, economic, political, and racial realities, and we see current forms of anti-Semitism, including white nationalist violence, tropes and stereotypes, philo-Semitism, among other forms. Next slide. We look at Jewish immigrants coming to the U.S. from different parts of the world and how they faced discrimination and exclusion, along with other immigrant communities during different periods. At the same time, of course, African Americans and Native Americans continued to face severe marginalization, violence, and racism that has characterized the long history of racism and exploitation rooted in white supremacist structures and ideology. Next slide, please. And we focus on some of the manifestations of anti-Semitism in the US today, beginning with the rise of white nationalist violence against Jews and against so many of our communities. And while we've highlighted places and ideologies that we believe anti-Semitism is most present and concerning, we also recognize that anti-Semitic attitudes and views like all forms and manifestations of injustice can show up among anyone who lives in our society. Next slide, please. We see how the 2017 Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia, exemplifies the nature of white nationalist violence in action. The rally's goal, rooted in anti-Black racism, called for the unification of the white nationalist movement and opposition to the proposed removal of the General Robert E. Lee statue. As part of their racist attacks. Participants paraded in Klan robes and swastikas and shouted, Jews will not replace us. Next slide, please. So uh, stereotypes and tropes have been used historically and continue to be used in different ways that harm or mischaracterize Jews. We've seen the many ways that these characterizations of Jews continue to be articulated and used differently in different settings and can take different forms. Next slide, please. While it is critically important to understand what anti-Semitism is, equally important is to understand what anti-Semitism is not. Organized campaigns are derailing and misstating the meaning of anti-Semitism and falsely conflating it with criticism of Israel and Zionism. The misstating and distortion of what anti-Semitism is, it furthers political goals that are harmful to our work for justice, including that of ending anti-Semitism. Next slide, please. There are many, many examples of fabricated cases of anti-Semitism instigated by those standing in opposition to human rights and justice for the Palestinian people. These false accusations of anti-Semitism have intensified as people across the globe have spoken out and taken action in response to Israel's genocidal assault on the Palestinian people of Gaza. Next slide, please. As we think about moving forward together, we ground ourselves in the long trajectory of those who have resisted injustice. We share examples of solidarities and foundational principles which reflect a commitment to collectively and intentionally challenging injustice together. We also explore challenges, possibilities, and strategies for working together for collective liberation. Next slide, please. Um, and we can actually end the screen share and um, I just want to thank, thank you. And I also want to say that you don't have to be an expert in anti-Semitism to be able to bring this conversation to your school or your community. Clearly, we all can and do learn from one another as we put into practice our multiple commitments to liberation for all. Um, and I'd like now to introduce Leslie Williams who is our moderator for this evening's program. Leslie is an educator and organizer with Jewish Voice for Peace. 
the Center for Jewish Nonviolence, and the International Jewish Collective for Justice in Palestine. We are also so lucky that she is a project advisor and facilitator for our curriculum on anti-Semitism from a framework of collective liberation. Thank you so much, Leslie, and thank you all. Thank you, Nina, and welcome, everyone. I am delighted and honored to be moderating this important discussion. There is a long and robust history of educators as social justice advocates, both inside and outside the classroom. Whether it was the freedom schools and citizenship schools during the civil rights movement or the ethnic studies movement in California, teachers have always played a role in guiding and supporting their students in how to combat racism, classism, and social injustice. Yet these efforts are often stymied by cautious administrators, fearful of controversy, and parents or other community members who feel that certain groups are being scapegoated or their children shamed. The curriculum battles we've seen recently in Florida over African-American history and in Arizona over Mexican studies are but two recent examples. However, one of the most bitter divides is over the teaching of anti-Semitism and the teaching of Palestinian history. As educators in California and elsewhere push for a liberated ethnic studies curriculum that would include a comprehensive discussion of the Palestinian Nakba in the context of global anti-colonial struggle, many Jewish families and pro-Israel institutions have fought to undermine such programs, claiming they ignore and actually perpetuate anti-Semitism. Schools are hearing demands for standalone anti-Semitism curricula and mandates to teach about the Holocaust when no such mandates exist for teaching about other forms of racism or other genocides. As the bombardment of Gaza continues and American societal divisions over Israel and Palestine are thrown into relief, what is the role of classroom teachers in addressing anti-Semitism and anti-Palestinian racism alongside anti-Blackness and Islamophobia? Is it possible to teach anti-Semitism apart from these other forms of social oppression? How do we accurately present the overlapping identities of white Jewish Americans as both victims of anti-Semitism, but beneficiaries of white privilege? And finally, how do we respond to those who insist that schools and teachers should be neutral or objective on issues of social justice? I'm pleased to be joined today by four extraordinary teachers and social justice activists to help us dive into these questions. With me are Uju Agarwal, an educator and organizer who teaches at the New School University in New York and the author of the book, Unsettling Choice, Race, Rights, and the Partitioning of Public Education. Uju is also a community reviewer of Parseo's curriculum and is on Parseo's advisory board. Welcome, Uju. Um, next, we have Carlos Borrero. Carlos has been an educator in New York City public schools for 24 years and is currently the principal of the High School for Community Leadership in Jamaica, Queens. Welcome, Carlos. Uh, next, we have Nat Natalia Ortiz, a mother of two and a native New Yorker who was educated in New York public schools and brings 18 years of experience as a classroom teacher, university professor, racial equity practitioner, coach, mentor, organizer, writer, and facilitator. She is currently a clinical assistant professor at New York University in the Department of Teaching and Learning and a core member of the New York Core of Radical Educators, or NICOR. Natalia, thank you for being here. And finally, we have Nassim Zarifi, who teaches history and current events and leads the activism project at Manhattan County School. He has taught at MCS for 10 years and has 17 years experience leading groups of students in designing and implementing activism campaigns in both public and private schools. And he is also a member of NICOR. So welcome to all our panelists and let's go ahead and dive into the conversation. Um, so I'd like to ask each of you to share a little bit about your work in your schools and your communities um, and how you bring this focus on social justice, critical inquiry and meaningful learning space to your students, teachers and the broader community. And so I would love to start with Uju. I think you're muted. Nope. nope. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, you. There we go. thank you, Leslie, um, for that introduction. And thank you um, to Nina and Donna from Parseo and Haymarket um, for bringing us together today. Um, really excited for this conversation and to learn um, from these amazing folks you've assembled. Um, 
So how I enter this conversation is a, is um, coming from working um, with Donna um, actually uh, for over, over for a very long time at this point um, uh, through an organization that we had uh, built with others called the Center for Immigrant Families. It was a community organizing an education center um, uh, of poor and working class uh, immigrant women of color um, rooted in popular education. And we didn't set out to organize around public schools, but we ended up organizing around kind of the intersection of public schools and gentrification. Um, and through that work, um, really thinking about kind of what does equity mean um, in schools, who do public schools serve, um, and uh, and what are their limits, um, and what what is kind of, what do we need to transform? Also, um, and I continue to work with um, uh, organization uh, Head Start Center actually in the same neighborhood, the Bloomingdale Head Start Center, and a project there called the Parent Leadership Project um, that is, that continues some of the work of CIA really fighting for um, dignity and uh, racial equity and economic justice in the public schools um, uh, in the in the neighborhood and in, in the district and in the city more broadly um, uh, I also am part of uh, Parseo, as you mentioned, and um, work with a group called Teachers Unite, um, and have more recently got into um, facilitate co facilitate with a, a Rosie Freshella, um, a ITAG um, group, an inquiry into action group uh, as part of Night Court. Um, and, uh, and that's been really thinking about a lot of these questions of this um, that you just posed, Leslie, right? Um, and thinking about the really broad and bold coalitions that came together in the, in the aftermath of October 7th, um, in thinking about um, coming together to uh, to demand that our schools be sites of of uh, of teaching justice, right? Um, rather than shutting down um, students, rather than sites of Islam pushing forward Islamophobia and anti-Arab sentiment and anti-Palestinian sentiment, um, and continuing, of course, then anti-Black and uh, anti and racist sentiment more broadly. Um, so these coalitions came together in the kind of, I think our job in this ITAG is to then think about, well, how do we continue them? So really think dialectically in this moment about what this moment is teaching us and how it's helping us expand and embolden our struggles for justice in our schools and then um, necessarily integrate internationalism into them as well. Thank you. Okay. And it's wonderful to hear the idea about coalition work. And I hope that in the second part of this conversation, we can dig into that a little bit more. So I'd like to pass it on to Carlos. Welcome. Thank you, Leslie. And uh, thank you all. I, I'm really excited to be a part of this project. And of course, thank uh, Parseo and Haymarket for bringing this together. So my work in New York City public schools is really um, it's really the product of two sort of parallel strands of progressive educational thought that started to coalesce around the 90s. One was, uh, you know, this critical education theory that was really a response to some of the earlier Marxist work around education. Um, the central question uh, that they were engaged with was the question of agency within schools, within these um, state institutions, particularly um, to what degree do progressives within these institutions have the capacity to enact or to affect meaningful change. Uh, the other strand was really around the question of multiculturalism and, and how uh, people had um, from marginalized groups had been working around expanding what was uh, pretty widely accepted as a, a Eurocentric curriculum. And so how to make the curriculum more representative of the diversity um, that existed um, in schools and in society. And so uh, we came into existence as a product of all of this sort of theoretical work and a lot of the organi organizing work um, that was taking place, but also interesting and very importantly enough, um, we were also uh, at a critical moment in which the ruling elites, the ruling classes themselves, were beginning to question the traditional school uh, system. And many were advocating for reforms 
uh, sort of from this functionalist perspective in which the schools were seen as, um, you know, a, a ground to prepare students for the future economy. So there were a lot of, you know, sort of social factors that came together. And in a place like New York City, um, interestingly enough, um, for about a decade and a half, there was a big push to create new schools. This wasn't an explicitly progressive project, but there were many progressives that found a space um, within this movement. And so there were some projects that were really innovative, they were really interesting, and people were really thinking critically about how to create or open up these progressive spaces, whether it was around the way schools were organized, um, the relationships within the schools between, uh, the, you know, the, the working people within the schools, the teachers and the students. And, and critically for this discussion, the question of curricula, right? That was a critical component of this sort of uh, school reform movement um, of which we were a part. And, um, you know, one of the, the interesting and, and really un, unresolved questions with this movement that we were grappling with and we continue to grapple with is this question of multiculturalism from a framework of the sort of pluralist tradition that we've been um, uh, exposed to versus a more universalist tradition that is really a part of the you know progressive thinking historically um, and so this is this has been uh, uh, something that we've grappled with as we on the one hand embrace diversity but on the other hand we have to sort of guard against and we've attempted to guard against this idea of uh, enclosing people within these ascribed groups um, and really um, not so much as celebrating diversity, but uh, really homogenizing um, really complex identities. And so uh, that's where we are and we're, you know, we're still grappling with this question, but I think it ties really uh, well uh, into the question of collective liberation versus a, a, a yes. concept of liberation that's limited to a, an individual group. Yes, and I would love to dig more into that universalism versus multiculturalism, because I think that is a very common um, misconception of what multiculturalism is. So thank you so much for bringing that up. Um, all right, next we are going to go to Natalia. Hello, hello. Um, thank you again for having me. I'm excited to engage in this awesome dialogue with these beautiful people. Um, that you all have gathered. So thank you for thinking of me and the New York Collective of Radical Educators because um, part of how I come to the work and it's important for me um, to just lift up my history with the, my core in particular. So I come to the conversation as a former high school social studies teacher um, in Brooklyn, New York. And I was introduced to the New York Collective of Radical Educators by my longtime mentor, Keith Catone, who um, actually was my mentor teacher when I was learning how to teach. And he was one of the founding members of the New York Collective of Radical Educators. And so it's important, just a quick little history here. So NICOR folks, the six founding members um, came together um, in uh, protests against like US government military response to 9-11. And um, they were coming together because they were really upset with the ways that um, there was intense intentional military recruitment of youth of color in particular in their schools. And so um, ever since that, that was back in like 2002. Um, and so it's 20 years old, more than 20, 22 now, right? Um, where the collective of teachers have continued their work. And so this small group of teachers kept meeting, created a mission, um, wrote out 10 points of unity inspired by the Young Lords and the Black Panthers that really have shaped and guided our work and every iteration of leadership and membership over the last 20 years. Um, so that's how I come to the conversation. And just, um, you know, something to keep in mind is we are both current and former public school educators. We like to be explicit about talking about education because we understand that education is both teachers who are inside the classroom Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., but also educators are social workers, youth, um, de uh, youth development folks, right, after school folks, um, community organizer, adult ed. And so we welcome all folks to come to our meetings. 
um, and do the work with us. And so part of the way that we do the work, we fight for social justice in our school system and society at large by organizing and mobilizing teachers, developing curriculum, working with um, student, parent, um, and community organizations, because that's also important that we really do try to like partner with all the amazing folks that are doing good work. Um, and part of the, we, we try to provide a political home um, for radical educators, critical professional development. So really doing this like learning, unlearning, unpacking, right? Um, mm -hmm. With, of course, understanding like systemic um, oppression and having an analysis that critiques power so that we can fight for and towards collective liberation. So some of the ways that we do this is we hold open meetings where we bring um, topics that are ongoing fights, right, um, against mm -hmm. neoliberalism. But sometimes we also hold open meetings that are responsive to the moment. And so mm -hmm. that is what brought us to this particular conversation. Um, because of course, when in November, we were thinking about the ways that we needed to be responsive to our teachers, to our students and communities is like, well, we can't ignore this, right? Because every decision is a choice to either engage or not engage. And because we know that we have to like live into our points of unity, we were like, all right, sometimes we take the lead to facilitate um, conversations. But for this one, it seemed like we needed to call on some colleagues some experts in the field. And so we, of course, have been working and organizing with Donna Neville for a very long time, who then introduced us to Nina, who then put us on to like Parseo and this curriculum in particular, which we happily brought in um, to for them to facilitate just the curriculum and um, conversations with our teachers, um, and core teachers. So in addition, I just want to lift up the inquiry to action groups. This is something that we've been organizing for many years as well. And let, we heard Uju and Naseem, both of who are facilitating. And they're really what it is, it's inquiry. So six weeks of study um, by teachers for teachers, which then ends with some action. And so I will end there um, because I know we want to get into some awesome conversation. And I think that's a great kind of like hand off because I believe I'm not sure if Nassim is next but if he is <laughs> yeah, yeah. yes and I'm glad I'm glad you mentioned because uh, I'm not sure if everybody on this call knows what an ITAG is so thank you for explaining that and uh, for people that have worked with say teachers for social justice uh, that's another organization that uh, does wonderful ITAGs so um, Nassim take it away thank you thank you for the handoff Natalia um, yeah, I, uh, <clears throat> I've been working at Manhattan Country School for the last 10 years. I was at an organization called Global Kids for seven years before that. So for something like 17 years, I've been leading um, activism campaigns or facilitating activism campaigns, student-led activism campaigns with adolescents. Um, I also teach history and current events. Um, there's a certain tension between teaching history and facilitating activism campaigns. Uh, which I think gets to some of the topics we're talking about tonight, where, you know, as a history teacher, I want to just kind of present information and conflicting narratives and allow students to use primary sources to kind of evaluate the evidence of which narrative is, is, is stronger and kind of leave my opinion out of it. Um, and as an organizer and activist, what you want to do is kind of present a narrative, get people riled up, fired up and ready to go. Um, and and uh, so there's a certain balance there. And I think for me, you know, when we do activism, it's entirely student, the students have all the decision-making power. Um, so they choose the topic they wanna focus on, they choose what they wanna do about that topic, what they wanna focus on. And then once they've kind of made their decisions, come to their conclusions, right, right now our campaign is about um, substance abuse, drug abuse. And so now that they've heard from some experts and done some research, they're talking about harm reduction. And now once, once they've decided this is what we think is right and what we should do, then I can kind of go into organizer mode and, and mm -hmm. kind of affirm their own ideas back to them and strengthen that and get them kind of riled up and ready to take action. Um, I think it's really important. I would say for me, a couple of things I really want to highlight that doing activism with, with young people, with adolescents, to me, is the perfect pedagogy. It hits all the intellectual work that you want them to do. Uh, critical thinking, systems thinking, uh, persuasive writing, analytical thinking, et cetera, et cetera. It also takes all the kind of risky behaviors of adolescents um, and channels that in a positive direction. So they want to be a part of something powerful, right? That could be a gang or it could be a movement. 
you know, they want to challenge authority, right? That could be the teacher in the room or it could be their elected representative who they're going to go lobby and, and discuss with, right? They want to take risks. That could be smoking cigarettes or it could be like marching down the street and, and yelling and, and, and doing all those kinds of things. So um, there's that. I also think that doing activism mitigates uh, against the trauma of watching all of the terrible things that might be happening that they are taking in. Um, and I think that when you are feeling helpless, like you have no agency to do anything about it, it can be quite traumatizing. So giving students an outlet, I think is important. The other piece I would say about that is we don't live in a kingdom. We're not subjects, we, we are citizens. And that, you know, democracy, we're, we're trying to prepare students to be engaged citizens in a pluralistic democracy. So they have to be able to engage with different perspectives. They have to be able to work with other people to come up with solutions and then implement those solutions. And I think they, they don't need to wait till the future to be leaders. I think they can do it now. Um, I do work with uh, NICOR. I'm facilitating my second ITAG um, on teaching and organizing for Palestine. It's really been fascinating um, and great. Um, I would also say there's this theme of collective liberation, and I think this will come up later, but one thing in my history classes that, that I really try to uh, highlight with students is that like our race issues in America, to my understanding, is just another iteration of the colonial divide and conquer strategy. So it takes different forms in different countries, but if you look at any country that was colonized, um, that that they found whatever fissures and divisions and use that to separate people who actually have a lot in common uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as their primary strategy. And so the, the remedy to that is finding the connections of different oppressed groups, right? Who've been told that they should be, have an animosity towards each other or are separate from each other um, or resentful towards each other and, and, and realize that that is just a hustle that they've been running on us for hundreds of years um, and it's still working. Uh, so I think, you know, that the, the theme of collective liberation is really, really important for us to see the connections between different groups and something I think we'll talk about tonight. So I'm really grateful to Parseo and, and Haymarket and my fellow panelists uh, for having this conversation. Also, I will say on a personal note, as someone who is uh, half Jewish and half Arab, mm -hmm. uh, talking about anti-Semitism in this context is, uh, I think, so important. Um, and so needed and, and, and unfortunately is not happening in nearly as many places as it should be. So I'm really eager to get into some of our, our topics today. So I'll, I'll wrap it up there. Okay, thanks so much. So lots of wonderful ideas and thoughts that came out of that introduction. Um, so a couple of things that I wanted to throw out. Um, Carlos mentioned the difference between a multicultural perspective and a universalist perspective. And we were also talking about anti-Semitism and you know, Nassim, you had just said that we, we don't always think of anti-Semitism as being part of the collective liberation. And unfortunately, it has often been presented as though working against anti-Semitism is somehow in opposition to uh, working against Islamophobia or working against anti-Palestinian racism. So um, how do we, with using this collective liberation framework, um, how do we address that tension, particularly in schools that um, may not be as forward thinking as the schools that you're in, um, schools that may be suburban, uh, rural, maybe have more leery administrations. So as I said, we're going to go in the opposite direction. So Nassim, you get to, <laughs> you get to finish your thought. And oh, then great. we'll move on to uh, Carlos and Natalia and uh, Uju. Yeah. Um, and I, I would say like right here in New York City in like supposedly progressive you know, independent schools and, and public schools, there's a lot of resistance to even having any of these conversations at the moment. There's a huge amount of fear that people have about broaching the subject. Um, people are, are really quiet when they need to be loud. Uh, I think there's some really, that, that perceived uh, contrast is so false to me. Um, you know, anti-Semitism and Islamophobia are very parallel. You know, uh, for example, you know, when just on a personal note, when Trump was elected and he tried to institute the Muslim ban, uh, you know, I, I felt like it was, uh, you know, you have a, a religious minority being targeted by a fascist. Right. So if he's targeting my Muslim half, but in a way that was very triggering to my Jewish half, you know, uh, because it's the same. It's exactly the same policy. You know, when we talked about Syrian refugees, 
uh, when, when that conflict was happening, my students did an activism campaign about Islamophobia and Syrian refugees. And we looked at the arguments that uh, right-wing politicians were making about why we should not let Syrian refugees in. And they were exactly the same arguments about why people didn't let in Jewish refugees fleeing World War II. You know, everyone reads Anne Frank, but we don't talk about the fact that Anne Frank's parents tried to come to the United States and were rejected. You know, we frame in the United States, we frame the, the conversation around Nazism and anti-Semitism mostly just around the Holocaust. And that way we are able to say like, oh, look at those terrible Nazis over there. And we were the good people who defeated the Nazis, right? Never mind the fact that the Nazis got so much of their ideology from eugenics, you know, pseudoscience from the United States. Um, as the book Cast points out, they thought that our Jim Crow laws were a little too harsh for, for the Nazis, right? And then even American, white American soldiers were, were, were sit, would sit with the Nazi prisoners of war before they sat with black uh, American soldiers, you know, during World War II. And they refused to, to let in all these um, Jewish refugees. And in fact, that is a big part of the reason why there was so much support for Zionism in Europe and in the United States was it was an interest convergence. They said, fantastic, you know, you guys, you know, uh, want, you want a homeland somewhere else? Right. We'd be happy to see you go, yeah. you know, no problem there. You can also, uh, in exchange, you can kind of be our representative or in mm -hmm. that region, you know, and help facilitate our interests in the Middle East. Um, and so I think it's really important to talk about anti-Semitism with some political consciousness of, of, its, of its origins, of its existence in the United States, of the parallels that it shows with Islamophobia today um, and other forms of discrimination and prejudice. And so I think in our schools, uh, one thing I really wanna highlight right now is part of the reason why teachers, I think, and administrators are afraid to talk about Israel and Palestine right now is because they understand that people are on very different sides have very kind of uh, opposing realities uh, mm -hmm. on this issue, and they don't want to open up a conversation that's going to further, that's going to highlight the divides that exist, because right. they don't know how to heal that or fix that. And in my experience, it seems like a lot more students of color tend to identify more with the Palestinian cause. Mm -hmm. right? And whereas more Jewish students might have grown up in a house that that may be anti-Zionist or, or or might be Zionist or 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 might, they might just say, okay, Israel relates to my identity, therefore I, I have to side with Israel. And so they're afraid of widening those divides between students. But I think if you talk about anti-Semitism with some political consciousness from a perspective of collective liberation, you open the opportunity for a dialogue that finds connections between students that weren't necessarily seeing those connections. Um, you know, and I think that's super important for us to do is to not look at different systems of oppression. Um, as different. Isolation. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, and I think it, it, unfortunately, human beings don't innately just say, OK, I've been oppressed. So I understand that that's bad. And therefore, I will not uh, perpetrate mm -hmm. in other ways. You know, you can sit, fight against racism and still be homophobic. Right. You know, you can fight against sexism and still be racist. Um, and so we need to intentionally look at the connections between these different things from an intersectional perspective. Look and at, look at collective liberation. Correct. And look at why these things exist. Why does anti some you know, discrimination doesn't just exist because people are stupid. It serves a purpose for somebody. You know, somebody is benefiting from racism. Somebody's benefiting from sexism. Someone's benefiting from anti-Semitism. Uh, and so we have to look at it from that context. Um, so, Nassim, I want to bring uh, Natalia in, but Please. hold that thought. So, Natalia. Yeah. Um, no, something that I was thinking about actually, Nassim, to build off of what you were saying um, is like even thinking about this piece around like teachers, right, are afraid to open up the conversation in their classrooms. And part of it is also like um, the fear, right? The fear and feeling the need to like hold space for healing and fixing it. Um, and then I heard you name this piece around like entering the conversation with political consciousness um, and finding commonalities. And I think that's where like the night, so this NICOR, right? And what we try to do is like provide that political consciousness, the history, right? Which is why we brought in this curriculum on anti-Semitism um, from a framework of a collective liberation, because we knew that while teachers while wanna teachers be responsive, responsive to, their to their students, I hear a little feedback. Is that just me? Yeah. Okay, while teachers want to be responsive um, to their students, families, right? Part of 
um, the fear that was coming up is the fear to be called anti-Semitic, right? Mm -hmm. And interestingly, <laughs> there was this piece of like, well, I don't know enough, right? Or this, 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 like, it's too complicated, right? So if I open up this container or this mm -hmm. space in the class and I don't have the time, nor the capacity, nor the conditions to continue the conversation, like, what does that look like? How can I do this in ways that are affirming to students that is centering collective liberation? And so that is why we were like, okay, we really need to hold or create space for our teachers to really understand what anti-Semitism is and the real horror, right? And how that is systemic oppression and violence and what that has looked like over the years, both in the US and globally. Um, and also, right, alongside that, equally as important, understanding how um, anti-Semitism is also dangerously being conflated with anti-Zionism. Mm -hmm. And so we, when thinking about this through that collective liberation framework, we knew that part of um, supporting, right, Palestinian students and families is to also understand the real lived experiences and realities and the systemic oppression of anti-Semitism and also what it is not, right? Um, I'll stop there. All right. Um, Carlos, your thoughts. So I, I think that it's important to be honest about the, the, the fact that Every decision to include or exclude content or discussion in school is a, or particularly in a curriculum, is it's a political decision. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for those that in some of the areas, as you were mentioning, perhaps you know maybe rural areas, um, that make the argument in favor of a supposed depolitization of schools they're actually engaged in a form of politics. That's a form of politics. And we and we should recognize that and we should stop pretending that there is no intrusion of politics um, in, in schools. I mean, anyone that's ever attended a school board meeting understands that, right? The questions that we should be asking are what kind of politics, what kinds of values do we want our schools to embody, right? Um, that's that's the real question, I think, and and I think that we should embrace that. Um, the other reality that we have to to kind of uh, grapple with is that in any time of acute sort of social and uh, political crisis, um, all of the institutions of society are going to um, be put to a test, right? Like. It is impossible to go, I would imagine, it's impossible to go to a school in the United States um, currently that doesn't have publicly uh, written somewhere or doesn't espouse a certain set of values, right? You know, a school individually or a district will say, you know, we value uh, uh, critical thinking. We want to we wanna build the critical thinking skills of the students. We value equality. We value tolerance, justice, integrity, all these things. It's in social crises that we see the fidelity with which those that lead these institutions actually, uh, you know, are embracing those those values. And, um, you know, invariably, because schools don't exist in a bubble, all of these moments where you see people are in the streets, where you see the youth, that have done an amazing job mobilizing. Um, these are moments in which you know the schools are put and, and other social institutions are put to the test. Um, and in some instances, uh, you know, we're we're able to grapple with these questions and create these spaces for these very difficult conversations. And then unfortunately, all too many uh, situations, the the move is to suppress whether it's, you know, making this argument um, that, you know, that politics don't belong in schools or um, there are more uh, sort of overt forms of repression that are used to suppress um, uh, these very difficult conversations. And so um, I think it, it, the question is not that it will, whether or not it's going to happen, whether or not 
young people and, and all people um, are going to engage in this kind of civil um, uh, discourse. The question is, how do we structure it so that something positive comes out of it? Right. And so uh, certainly uh, to Nazim's point, you know, this sort of um, this view that it's this side against the other side um, and, you know, the win for this particular side understood as a monolithic group, which it really isn't right, represents a loss for this other group um, that has has proven bankrupt. And, and we need to move more towards a collective liberation kind of view, uh, a view that, that prizes solidarity and uh, sort of more universalist principles in, uh, in my mind. Okay. And, you know, I mean, just something, if we have time, I'd, I'd love to get all of your reactions. Um, we often hear that, um, you know, this is too divisive, that um, this is going to, but that talking about these issues is going to destroy unity and not just with Israel and Palestine, but, you know, again, in Florida with Black Lives Matter, that talking about that in schools is going to make white kids feel bad, that it's going to lead to division. So, you know, are there ways that we can do this collective liberation uh, and address that concern? But for now, Udra, I'm going to give it to you. You can, you can address that question or another question, whichever one you want. Okay. Um, well, I want to bring us, I think that maybe in some ways bringing us back to just how the curriculum itself it provides us with an organizing framework um, is really helpful. So it's both kind of content, but then also the pedagogy of it, right? Mm -hmm. um, that I think is so important. Um, and by that, I mean that it helps us think through questions of how do dominant narratives about our communities get constructed, right? Um, who do they serve? How do we, how can we think about questions of, as others have indicated, questions of power rather than just simply individual attitudes or behaviors or beliefs, right? How do we root those in kind of, again, structures and systems, as others have said? How do we think about historical contingency and context, right? Um, to better understand then the links between racism, anti-Semitism, xenophobia, right? And more, um, what changes, what stays the same over time and place, but also again, in relationship to how power is shifting and different historical conjunctures that we find ourselves in. Um, and also, of course, in liberation movements, right? Um, how power is then responding to solidaristic movements of resistance, of broader visions of liberation and trying to then segment us or make us believe that it's only our freedom we can fight for, whoever ours is supposed to be in that, in that context, right? And so I think some of the ways that the curriculum pushes us to think not just about history, but also about our present um, is really important to think about then what are the solidarities we can forge um, in thinking beyond kind of allyship, right? But really broad and bold solidarities um, that are about a transformation of power that maybe leave us in a different situation than where we began, hopefully. Um, and so I think in some ways it's, it helps us think about how do we understand what is happening with all the repression that the others have mentioned are happening at the level that students, the teachers, that parents are facing, but then also some of the ways that, you know, power, dominant power moves through kind of liberalism as well. Um, so for example, you know, on one hand, there was a doxing truck outside of an elementary school around the corner um, where, from where I live. On the other hand, we see restorative justice circles being used as punitive measures, right? Um, that punish people for taking stands and say, say, okay, well, you have to hold a circle now in order to hold account for what you taught or what you said or what you did. Um, and it's, I think that that's a tactic that turns, of course, intention of restorative justice on its head, but also something that black and indigenous organizers have long been kind of saying, hey, there's something weird about how, um, how dominant power has absorbed some of the tactics um, that are meant to transform it, not be absorbed by it. So, I say that as 
somebody who's just trying to think through kind of right now, well, what are these contradictions and teaching us, right? And how does a curriculum really help us um, kind of move away from that kind of, uh, as you were saying, Carlos, the kind of, you know, move away from a way, move away from a stance that says it's a, that maintaining the status quo is in some ways equitable, in some way equitable, and rather direct us to understanding the violence embedded in a stance like that, right? Um, to thinking again about kind of um, how, yeah, we need to be really thinking about how structures and systems of power are embedded um, in our schools and communities and work to then transform them. Um, Natalia, something you were talking about kind of in an earlier conversation about learning history is not comfortable, right? Um, and it's not necessarily easy, but does that mean that it needs, that it's harmful, right? So how I think part of what the curriculum really does and gives us tools and in a way um, of helping us think through is how we, you know, how we can think outside of a state, a kind of the state's mentality that tells us only redress for harm or trauma is, for example, the expansion of the criminal legal system or hate crimes legislation, right? To really thinking about, well, okay, what is power doing in this moment and how do we need to work to transform it? Wonderful, wonderful. Um, so we have a huge two minutes left. Um, we may be able to push it a little bit beyond that, but I'd love to get um, just a final comment from each of you, thinking maybe, you know, again, that our audience is teachers all over the country um, who may be kind of new to doing this, this, to seeing activism as part of their work. How can they find solidarity and support? And how have you as educators, as radical educators, found solidarity and support? Um, so Uju, I'll start with you again. Yeah, I mean, I guess one thing is thinking about kind of, again, I think the curriculum does this. I think we can think about our, which stories we tell and which ones we don't. Um, so there, in the fall, people were saying uh, often, right, this idea of, well, Palestine is freeing us. And I think we can think about, well, what does that mean for those of us residing inside of the belly of the beast? Um, how is it pushing us to expand our radical imaginations, our freedom dreams, um, how we think again about interconnectedness and internationalism? I think it pushes us to something very basic that was true for my parents' generation who grew up during British colonialism, right, and lived through it, um, which was the, a vision of third world liberation that was never about just one place or one people, but about a transformed world, right? Um, and that it's our duty to fight for that. Um, and whether that's in schools or see that as uh, kind of in all aspects of life. So it's it's interconnected and it's intertwined. And I think, again, that's one of the things that the curriculum makes clear. Great, thank you. Uh, Carlos. I think, I think one of the great values of this type of curriculum, and certainly I got a chance to look at a lot of these materials, is in dispelling this idea of one sort of monolith right so these people groups as um you know they're they're we we embrace multiculturalism to the point or in, uh, up until the point in which we talk about um the the diversity within the group right mm -hmm. um and so for many students that are perhaps don't have a direct relationship with some of the groups let's say uh, the Jewish experience, they don't realize the incredible diversity of that experience, right? They don't realize um, the contributions that are made. And they also don't realize that um, there, there are real practical examples of solidarity, even within the context of Palestine, um, uh, that are important. And so this question that I must align myself with uh, a sort of right-wing uh, representative of this group that uh, this group identity that was ascribed to me um, is challenged by this kind of curriculum. And I think that that is something that is critically important at this moment. And I think that we're seeing practical examples of it every day um, among the youth that are organizing 
not just Palestinian youth that are heroically organizing, but also Jewish youth in countries like the United States that are heroically organizing um, on the basis of these universalist, these collective liberation kinds of principles. Um, and I think that that needs to be elevated and applauded and supported. Yes, thank you so much. Natalia. Yeah, I was trying to think of the both and because I feel like if teachers are looking to do this work and I know it can sometimes, especially if you're kind of new into like learning and trying activism and understanding that your role as a teacher is to, um, it, what Carlos was saying before, right? Like teaching is not neutral. <laughs> like everything is political, right? A choice to teach or not teach. And so if we're kind of embracing this new, this idea, like, what can I do? Well, right, it's important to study. I always think about Pablo Freire, right, who talks about reflection and action praxis. Like, every time you learn, you reflect, you, you become a new you, right? It's like a dialectical process of learning and engaging and then being a different person. And so what does it mean to do that, right, to find the knowledge? This curriculum has it all, right? It has knowledge, history, power analysis, intersectional oppression, understanding that. And so, like, Studying this oppression, starting, I mean, starting this curriculum, so, sorry, starting there is important, but community, like none, I would not be the teacher I am, the educator I am, if at the age of, well, I don't want to tell you how old I was when I met Keith or like started to engage with NICOR, but like part of what had me feel stronger in the classroom to try things, to engage in difficult conversations, to teach true history, even though it was maybe at times scary, but honest and real, um, was because I knew I was not alone. And when I say I was not alone, not even I'm not even talking about like my school building. I'm talking about like there are educators across the country, right? Um, teacher activist group, T4SJ, TSJ, People's Ed Move in Cali. Um, there's a Free Minds Free People conference that happens every two years that gathers teachers, professors, students, community organizers, parents that come together to talk about social justice education issues, right? And seeing like the interconnectedness of all of our fights and struggles. Um, there's folks doing ethnic studies across the country, a liberated ethnic studies curriculum, right? So it's out there. It just requires like time, connection, and engagement. So that's, yes. Yes, community. indeed. Uh, Nassim, you get the last word. Okay. Um, yeah, I want to uplift this idea that Jewish people are not a monolith. Um, and I think that the fear of being labeled anti-Semitic is real because there are real world consequences to that. I know as a Jewish person, I've been a little more brave speaking up um, because if someone challenges me, like, you know, I feel like I can say, you know, my grandfather was a rabbi. Like I've been, my life has been threatened because I'm Jewish, like, but it's harder for other people I think to have this conversation with the fear of being labeled anti-Semitic. But to me, I think the idea that you can just make Jewish people a monolith and then associate them with, with you know, the policies of the state of Israel is anti-Semitic. And as a Jewish person, the thing that makes me feel the least safe is that idea that the state of the policies of the state of Israel, the actions of the state of Israel represents each Jewish person, right? That we are then able to be held responsible for what Israel as a, as a country does. Um, the other thing I would say is that people tend to look at history, right, differently than they look at the present. So when Black Lives Matter movement was starting before George Floyd, right, um, current events teachers went to a, a, a conference and people were not talking about it in their current events classes. And I was like, how, you know? And um, so I did, a, I was doing a professional development at this conference and I pulled up, you know, the polls during the civil rights movement to show how unpopular the civil rights movement was at the time. Now today, every single person, right wing, left wing, doesn't matter who, is going to say that they would have supported Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement. At the time, that was not the case, you know? And so to just have that context that, you know, we tend to look at the kind of radical movements of the past as acceptable today when they were not at all accepted at the time. And to say, okay, what would I have done in this context? What would I have said? Who which side would I have been on? Would I have spoken up or not? And today is that moment. And to show people, you know, you can even have these conversations to say like, yeah, this is a controversial thing to talk about. Isn't that our job? Is it not our job to help our students to engage in controversial, difficult, real world conversations, to see different perspectives that conflict with each other, to try and if they have their own opinion, to then provide support or evidence for their own opinion? That's our job, right? If and people who might say, well, this, this curriculum doesn't reflect the dominant Jewish narrative 
fantastic. You know, if there is a dominant narrative that's in the mainstream culture, don't you then want to present contrasting narratives for your students to be able to engage in ideas? Isn't that what school is about, right? To allow them to come to their own conclusions from seeing different perspectives. Um, I think that's really important, really crucial. Uh, and I think, you know, you do need your community there. Like Natalia said, you know, and there, there are resources out there. There are people out there that you can connect with, but you also just need to be brave. You know, and I understand if you're like a brand new teacher and you're trying not to lose your job is one thing, but I think there's a lot of people who are conflating safety with comfort, you know, mm -hmm. and we're putting the comfort of the most powerful students before the safety of the least powerful students consistently, right? We don't want to talk about Black Lives Matter because we don't want white kids to be uncomfortable. What about the black kids who are seeing this happening? They're having their own conversations. And that's the other thing, the kids are talking already. Whether mm -hmm. we bring it up as teachers or not, whether we have a skillful, facilitated conversation or not, they are already talking. Harm is already happening. Divisions are already known, right? It is our job to facilitate that and make that work in a, in a more healthy way in our classes. Fantastic, fantastic. Um, I'm afraid we're going to have to close this out. Um, but if you are a teacher, activist, educator, you would like to know more about the anti-Semitism curriculum from a framework of collective liberation and um, get some of the resources that we talked about. You can get in touch with Parseo by going to antisemitismcurriculum.org. Um, you can also email Parseo at antisemitismcurriculum at gmail.com. And I just want to thank again our terrific panelists. Man, would I have loved to have had any of you as my teacher in high school. Um, Nassim Zarifi, Natalia Ortiz, Carlos Barrero, and Uju Agarwal. So thank you all so much. And thank you to Nina and uh, Donna and Parseo and to all of you for attending. And we will see you in the streets and in the classroom. Bye, everybody.